This lecture will go over peripheral arterial disease and acute peripheral arterial occlusion. Peripheral arterial disease, also known as PAD, is a result of systemic atherosclerosis. It is a chronic condition in which partial or total arterial occlusion or blockage decreases perfusion to the extremities. The tissue below the narrowed or obstructed, obstructed arteries cannot live without an adequate oxygen and nutrient supply. Atherosclerosis is the most common cause of chronic arterial obstruction. Therefore, the risk factors for atherosclerosis apply to PAD as well. Advancing age also increases the risk for disease related to atherosclerosis. Most patients with PAD have an increased risk for developing chronic angina, MI, and stroke, and are much more likely to die within 10 years than those who do not have the disease. African Americans are affected more often than any other group, most likely because they have many risk factors such as diabetes and hypertension. The clinical course of chronic PAD can be divided into four stages. Please see chart 36-3. Patients do not experience symptoms in the early stage of the disease. Most patients are not diagnosed until they develop leg pain. Most patients initially seek medical attention for a classic leg pain known as intermittent claudication. Claudication is pain caused by too little blood flow, usually during exercise. Usually the patient can walk only a certain distance before discomfort, such as cramping or burning muscular pain, forces them to stop. The pain stops with rest. When the patient resumes walking, they can walk the same distance before it returns. Thus, the pain is considered reproducible. Also, as the disease progresses, they can walk only shorter and shorter different distances before pain recurs. Ultimately, it may occur even when at rest. Rest pain, which may begin while the disease is still in the stage of intermittent cla claudication, is a numbing or burning sensation often described as a feeling like a toothache that is severe enough to awaken patients at night. It is usually located in the toes, the foot arches, the forefoot, the heels, and rarely in the calves or ankles. Patients can sometimes alleviate pain by keeping the limb in a dependent position below the heart. Those with rest pain often have advanced disease that may result in limb loss. Inflow obstructions involve the distal end of the aorta and the common internal and external iliac arteries. They are located above the inguinal ligament. Patients with inflow disease have discomfort in the lower back, buttocks, or thighs. Outflow obstructions involve the femoral, popliteal, and tibial arteries and are below the superficial femoral artery. Patients with outflow disease describe burning or cramping in the calves, ankles, feet, and toes. Specific findings for PAD depend on the severity of the disease. Observe for loss of hair on the lower calf, ankle, and foot, dry, scaly, dusky, paled, or mottled skin, and thickened toenails. With severe arterial disease, the extremity is cold and gray-blue or cyanotic or darkened. Pallor may occur when the extremity is elevated. Dependent rubor or redness may occur when the extremity is lower. Muscular atrophy can result from prolonged chronic arterial disease. Palpate all pulses in both legs. The most sensitive and specific indicator of arterial function is the quality of the posterior tibial pulse because the pedal pulse is not palpable in a small percentage of people. The strength of each pulse should be compared bilaterally. No early signs of ulcer formation and complete ulcer formation as a complication of peripheral arter arterial disease. Initi initially, arterial ulcers are painful and develop on the toes, often the great toe, between the toes, or on the upper aspect of the foot. With prolonged occlusion, the toes can become gangrenous. Typically, the ulcer is small and round with a punched out appearance and well-defined borders. Please see chart 36-4 which has a photo and descriptions of arterial ulcers. Magnetic resonance angiography is commonly used to assess blood flow in the peripheral arteries. A contrast medium is used to visualize blood flow through these arteries. This test is often the only one used to diagnose PAD, although a CTA may also be performed. 
using a Doppler probe, segmental systolic blood pressure measurements of the lower extremities at the thigh, calf, and ankle are an inexpensive, non-invasive method to assess PAD. Normally, blood pressure readings in the thigh and calf are higher than those in the upper extremity. With the presence of arterial disease, these pressures are lower than the brachial pressure. With inflow disease, pressures taken at the thigh level indicate the severity of disease. The ankle, the ankle pressure is normally equal to or more than the brachial pressure. To evaluate outflow disease, compare ankle pressures with the brachial pressure, which provides a ratio known as ankle brachial index. The value can be direct, derived by dividing the ankle blood pressure by the brachial blood pressure. An ABI of less than 0 0.90 in either leg is diagnostic of PAD. Patients with diabetes are known to have falsely elevated ABI. Exercise tolerance testing by chemical stress tests or treadmill may be give valuable information about claudication or muscle pain. The technician obtains resting pulse volume recordings and asks the patient to walk on a treadmill until symptoms are reproduced. At the time of the symptom onset, or about five minutes, the technician obtains another pulse volume recording. Normally, there may be an increased waveform with minimal, if any, drop in ankle pressure. In patients with arterial disease, the waveforms are decreased, and there is a decrease in ankle pressure in the affected limb. If the return to normal pressure is delayed longer than 10 minutes, the result suggests abnormal arterial flow in the affected limb. Plethysmography can also be performed to evaluate arterial flow in the lower extremities. The measurement provides graphs or tracings of arterial flow in the limb. If an occlusion is present, the waveforms are decreased to flattened, depending on the degree of occlusion. Non-surgical management of PAD includes exercise and positioning. Exercise may improve arterial blood flow to the affected leg through the buildup of collateral circulation. Collateral circulation provides blood to the affected area through smaller vessels that develop and compensate for the occluded vessels. People with PAD can benefit from exercise that is started gradually and slowly increased. Instruct the patient to walk until the point of claudication, stop and rest, and then walk a little further. Eventually, he or she can walk longer distances as collateral circulation develops. Positioning to promote circulation has been somewhat controversial. Some patients have swelling in their extremities. Teach them to avoid raising their legs above the heart level because extreme elevation slows arterial blood flow to the feet. In severe cases, patients with PAD and swelling may sleep with the affected leg hanging from the bed or sit upright in a chair for comfort. Instruct all patients with the disease to avoid crossing their legs and to avoid wearing restrictive clothing, such as garters, which interfere with blood flow. Teach them the importance of inspecting their feet daily for color and other changes. Vasodilation can be achieved by providing warmth to the affected extremity and preventing long periods of exposure to cold. Encourage the patient to maintain a warm environment at home and to wear socks or insulated shoes at all times. Caution the patient to avoid applying direct heat to the limb with heating pads or extremely hot water. Sensitivity is decreased in the affected limb and burns may occur. Encourage patients to prevent exposure of the affected limb to the cold. Emotional stress, caffeine, and nicotine can also cause vasoconstriction. Emphasize the complete, that complete abstinence from smoking or chewing tobacco is essential to preventing vasoconstriction. In regards to drug therapy, pentaxifiline is a hemorrheologic hemor agent that increases the flexibility of red blood cells. It decreases blood viscosity by inhibiting platelet aggregation and decreasing fibrinogen and thus increases blood flow to the extremities. Antiplatelet agents such as aspirin and clopidogrel are commonly used. Patients with PAD and no contraindications to antiplatelet therapy should receive either aspirin or clopidogrel. Patients who are taking clopidogrel should not eat grapefruit or drink grapefruit juice because of risk of kidney failure, GI bleeding, heart failure, or even death. Patients who experience disabling intermittent claudication may also benefit from phosphodiesterase inhibitors such as silostazole. Controlling hypertension can improve tissue perfusion by maintaining pressures that are adequate to perfuse to, per to the periphery 
but not constrict the vessels. Teach about the effect of blood pressure on circulation and instruct in methods of control. For example, patients taking beta blockers may have drug-related claudication or worsening of symptoms. The primary health care provider closely monitors those who are receiving beta blockers. If the patient has high serum lipids, lipid-lowering lipid drugs such as statins are used. A non-surgical but invasive approach for improving arterial flow is the use of percutaneous vascular intervention. One or more arteries are dilated with a balloon catheter that opens the vessel and improves arterial blood flow. During percutaneous vascular intervention, intravascular stents, wire, mesh-like devices, are usually inserted to ensure adequate blood flow in a stenosed vessel. Another arterial technique to improve blood flow in ischemic legs in people with PAD is mechanical rotational abrasive atherectomy. The rotoblader device is designed to scrape plaque from the inside of the artery while minimizing damage to the vessel surface. Most people receive anticoagulant or antiplatelet therapy, such as heparin or clopidogrel, before and or during the procedure. An antiplatelet drug may be prescribed for one to three months or longer after the procedure to prevent arterial clotting. The priority for nursing care following a percutaneous vascular intervention or atherectomy is to observe for bleeding at the arterial puncture site, which is sealed with a special collagen plug. Monitor for manifestations of impending hypovolemic shock, including decreased blood pressure, increased pulse rate, and decreased urinary output. Perform frequent checks of the distal pulses, distal pulses in both legs to ensure adequate perfusion. In regards to surgical management for PAD, patients with severe rest pain or claudication that interferes with the ability to work or threatens loss of a limb become surgical candidates. Arterial revascularization is the surgical procedure most commonly used to increase arterial blood flow in the affected limb. The procedure involves bypassing the arterial occlusions with a graft. Post-op care in includes encouraging deep breathing every one to two hours and using the incentive spirometer. Patients who have undergone conventional aortoiliac or aortofemoral bypass are MPO status for at least one day after surgery to prevent nausea and vomiting, which could increase intra-abdominal pressure. Warmth, redness, and edema of the affected extremity are often expected outcomes of surgery as a result of increased arterial perfusion. Immediately after surgery, the PACU nurse should mark the distal pulse um, where it can be palpated or heard by Doppler ultrasound. This information should be communicated during handoff reports. To promote graft patency, monitor the patient's blood pressure and notify the surgeon if the pressure increases or decreases. Hypotension may indicate hypovolemia, which can increase the risk for clotting. Range of motion of the operative leg is usually limited with no bending of the hip or knee. Patients having open procedures may be restricted to bed rest for 24 hours or longer after surgery to prevent disruption of the suture lines. Graft occlusion is a post-op emergency that can occur within the first 24 hours of arterial revascularization. Monitor the patient for and report severe, continuous, and aching pain, which may be the first indicator of post-op graft occlusion and ischemia. Many people experience a throbbing pain caused by the increased blood flow to the extremity. Because this alteration in comfort is different from that of ischemic pain, be sure to assess the type of pain that is experienced. Pain from occlusion may be masked by PCA. Some patients have ischemic pain that is not relieved by PCA. Monitor the patency of the graft by checking the extremity every 15 minutes for the first hour and then hourly for changes in color, temperature, and pulse intensity. Compare the operative leg with the unaffected one. If the operative leg feels cold, becomes pale, ashen, or cyanotic, or has a decreased or abs absent pulse, contact the surgeon immediately.